All right. Hi, everyone. Uh, today, we are very happy to have uh, James Sully from University of British Columbia virtually visiting us and uh, kindly giving a seminar on his work on inner turmoil, complexity, chaos, and the black hole interior. Please, Jamie. Yeah, thank you for the invitation to speak. It's a pleasure to join you virtually. Uh, hopefully one day I can join you guys again in person. Um, so today I'd like to tell you about some work with uh, my three uh, fabulous collaborators, uh, Arjun Carr, Lampros Lempra, and Moshe Rosali, uh, all of whom are at UBC right now. Uh, and I'd like to begin with a reminder of what's been sort of a growing list of correspondences that have been developed over the past few years relating uh, universal features of quantum chaos to universal features of gravitational geometry and, and gravitational dynamics. So just to name a few of them, you know, we've learned how one can see the sort of features of scrambling and the out of time order correlator in a quantum chaotic theory in terms of uh, gravitational shock waves uh, in the dual theory, related operator size and the growth of complexity in the quantum theory to uh, the radial momentum of some infalling excitation in some black hole geometry. Uh, we've understood how eigenstate thermalization in these theories describes sort of the universal black hole exterior, so it describes how uh, correlation functions take sort of universal values. We've learned how uh, random matrix theories can be described in terms of low dimensional theories of gravity, like JT gravity. And we've learned how in these sort of, say, random matrix theories or chaotic theories, the sort of uh, spectral statistics, like the level repulsion and, and the corresponding ramp have a description in terms of Euclidean wormholes. I think it's fair to say that many of these manifestations of chaos that I just described, although certainly not all, are really about uh, the gravitational theory and the gravitational dynamics outside of black hole. So they describe, say, the experience of some infalling observer or some excitation that's falling into the horizon. And they describe that in terms of sort of the physics of thermalization and scrambling. But from the gravitational perspective, we know that sort of physics doesn't end there. It doesn't end at the horizon, that one can continue to fall into the interior of a black hole. And there's still simple gravitational dynamics that continue to happen as one moves through the interior. And so the question I'd like to ask today is sort of what about the this interior of the black hole, the, the black hole's interior turmoil? Can I, what can what can quantum chaos and the tools of quantum chaos teach us about uh, gravitational dynamics in the black hole interior? Is there also some correspondence between these two ideas there? So one promising probe that we do have of the black hole interior is complexity. So just to be specific, let's consider the thermofield double state. Here, I'm just going to represent this thermofield double as just a bunch of you know, maximally entangled qubits between some system A and B. And then I'm going to think about time evolving this state. And I'll think about that as just some sort of quantum circuit that acts on these qubits. So here is sort of the growing time evolution of the system. And one thing I notice is sort of as I time evolve the system, you know, this quantum circuit that's meant to describe the state is growing longer and longer. And so there's a natural notion of sort of the complexity of this state as a function of time, where I think about the complexity is just a measure of the number of gates in my circuit. And so here in this picture, the number of gates is just sort of increasing linearly with time. And so I think there's some linearly growing complexity in this theory. And that matches very nicely onto the gravitational picture. So in the gravitational picture, it's been proposed that I should think about complexity as the dual of the, uh, the volume of some uh, maximal volume bulk slice. And so here in this gravitational picture, one can time evolve the state and look at the, the volume and see that it is also increasing linearly with time. Sorry, Jamie, just yeah. one question. So like, uh, the, the picture on the left, the TFT you're plotting, you have yeah. in mind, this is some sort of a, uh, sort of a mirror picture in the bulk. Is that what it is? T equals zero surface? Yeah, so in, in well, not here, not T equals zero, but this, say this late time slice here, where I've had this sort of long right. interior geometry is meant to, the, the proposal I think is that the geometry of this uh, time slice is meant to be described by this quantum circuit here. Right, but you, you don't mean it in a Euclidean path integral way. Here, this is very, this is very much about 
Yeah, uh, Laurentian time. Yeah, thank you. Great. And please, anyone, do stop me uh, at any point during the talk. So, you know, we can. I can cover lots of things or just a few things uh, in more depth. So whatever, whatever is to everyone's interest. Uh, so you can use a very similar reasoning to talk about not the complexity of a state, but the complexity of an operator. So let me just draw some picture of here, some operator I can imagine. And I time evolve this operator now by acting on both sides with some circuit, which is gonna implement uh, time evolution. So I see again, here is this growing quantum circuit. I've given it two different colors here. Um, because some of these gates, say these gates here in orange, can cancel off that they can just sort of meet uh, the inverse on the other side and, and go away. And so it's only sort of these red gates that are sort of meaningfully increasing the complexity of the circuit I need to describe this time evolved operator. And so if I look at this picture, then I see that the complexity is increasing in time, but now increasing at an increasing rate, you know, actually growing exponentially. And we see that's just because, you know, as time goes on, the number of gates that don't cancel increases. And it increases in sort of a rate roughly proportional to the size of the operator. So as the size of the operator increases in time, uh, it increases the rate that the, the circuit is growing. And so we can sort of think about the, the size of the operator as describing the rate of change, the, the time derivative of the complexity. So there's a compelling correspondence between this operator size and in the bulk, the momentum of some infalling excitation. So this is something that we can see you know, very sharply in SYK or ADS2. So there we can throw in some excitation, some infalling excitation towards uh, the black hole. And one can see that the size of this excitation, say that the number of uh, fermions that it's made out of in SYK is really sort of exactly described by the corresponding bulk momentum. And so there's this nice picture then you can see that the, the size and the bulk momentum are both increasing exponentially in time as this excitation falls towards the horizon. Interestingly, you can also um, ask in this picture about the complexity. So as this excitation falls towards the horizon, it back reacts on the geometry and it causes the maximal volume slice also to increase uh, exponentially in time. So we could view this plot I did here either as the sort of size and bulk momentum or the complexity and the maximal volume. Both of them are increasing exponentially in time as it falls to the horizon. Uh, what's nice is that momentum and this maximal volume continue to evolve as this excitation falls inside the black hole. So as it falls inside the black hole, one sees that now uh, the maximal volume slice transitions from growing exponentially in time to growing linearly in time. At the same time, the momentum transitions from growing exponentially to being constant with time. And so it gives a nice picture then where we view this volume as complexity and we see the complexity transition from exponential to linear growth. And then the derivative of that complexity, the size of the operator transition from exponential to constant. So this is a, a nice feature of complexity and its dynamics inside the horizon that we'd like to describe uh, more sharply. So, sorry, Jamie, just one good question. So maximal volume. So can, can you define that quantity? Uh, what, what is the quantity again? Maybe so. Yeah, so we, we, we look at some fixed time in the boundary theory and ask about the slice of maximal volume in the bulk that ends at that time. I see. So it's, it's called dimension one. Yes. Okay, thank you. So what I'd like to do is try to find a definition of complexity that's concrete enough to reproduce these bulk calculations of the exponentially growing volume to transitioning to linear growing volume in the interior. So this uh, definition of complexity in terms of some quantum circuit is very nice. It's very sort of concrete and we can understand how it works, uh, but it doesn't make a whole lot of sense when we're in a continuum quantum field theory. And so we'd like to ask, can we find some definition of complexity that doesn't sort of uh, make use of it, you know, really of some discrete or finite dimensional quantum system? Uh, that really makes sense naturally in some continuum quantum field theory. There are or have been uh, proposals of how to do this. One of them is to think about the space of all uh, 
say operators and think about some path uh, in this space. So the space of all say unitaries and some path on this space, uh, say some geodesic path that would take you from one operator to another operator. And then to think about this geodesic distance in the space of unitaries as giving you the complexity you know, of how far you have to move. But one of the problems is that this space doesn't always come with a natural metric or at least a metric that makes uh, a lot of say sense for what a depth you know what a notion of complexity should be and so we have to maybe make some arbitrary choices about how what the cost the complexity penalty is about moving in one direction versus another direction and so another question i'd like to ask you you know can we find a definition of complexity in a continuum qft without sort of these arbitrary choices there is one natural notion of of distance uh, that's relevant to time evolution and that's sort of this, the distance of the time evolution itself. That is, you know, how long does one have to time evolve to get from one operator to another operator? This is also a very sort of natural uh, sort of canonical notion of distance if, if, you, if the thing you care about is time evolution. That is, so instead of uh, taking two operators in the space of unitaries and thinking about the shortest path, we just time evolve possibly for a very long time and wait until we get to where we want to go. And if a theory is sufficiently chaotic, you know, we, we expect that we'll explore the space ergodically with time evolution. And so if we wait long enough, we'll get to the operator we want to get to. So what I'm going to do is use time evolution to sort of build a, a discrete basis of operators in my Hilbert space. So I can start with some operator O, and then I can generate a new operator by acting with a commutator uh, of the Hamiltonian with that operator. And then I can sort of iterate this process. So I can act with the commutator again and again, and each time I can generate a new operator. And then I, I can think then that I have sort of this one dimensional parameterization of all the operators in my theory uh, ordered by how long it takes to get there by taking commutators of the Hamiltonian. And the general idea is then is that we'll think that the farther, our, the farther your operator is down this chain, the more complex it is. So something, just the operator itself is very simple, but it's where I had to act with many, many, many commutators is something that's called complex. And then we can view time evolution of some operator as a wave function that evolves in this basis. You know, so some given operator is maybe not any one particular element here, but it's some sort of wave packet spread over here. And where this wave packet sits sort of tells me how complex my operator is. And as I time evolve, it'll move to the right and become uh, a more complex uh, wave packet. Sorry, I'm, so, I'm a little bit confused. So the, the commutators with H are basically time derivatives of the operator. Mm -hmm. Right. So now yeah. you're saying that the kth time derivative of O is more complex than the lower derivatives of O. Is that what that's right? Okay. And I'm going to make not quite this. So that's sort of schematically what this uh, notion of uh, complexity that I'm describing is. But it, uh, you know, in a few slides later on, I'm going to make that much more sharp. Okay. So if you want to, yeah, you know, maybe wait a few minutes before you sort of ask about the details of this construction. And so. What I'm going to define then is this sort of notion of Krilov, or what I call k-complexity, will be the average position in the space of these operators. And so what we'll find is that the Krilov complexity has the same behavior as the volume, uh, that it starts off growing exponentially in time and then transitions to linear growth. Uh, also say, just to note, is that there's a, another notion you could talk about the complexity that's not Krilov complexity but is also a, a useful notion for continuum quantum field theories in the work of Hale and Zhao. And it's, it's also very interesting. And I you know, recommend if these are things that you're curious about to also look at their paper too, for sort of a, a different perspective on this problem. So one thing that's gonna be very nice is that in chaotic, that is gravitational systems, the dynamics on this K chain will have very nice long lived universal properties. And to understand sort of how these emerge, one thing we're gonna do is sort of Think about integrating out the sort of compl complex end of this k chain. So we take all these very complex operators and find some way to integrate them out. And we'll find is that the sort of simple operators will have some nice description in terms of some random matrix theory. So this is a different random matrix theory than uh, sort of we're used to thinking about um, in chaotic theories, but is, is also very interesting in its own right. And so this universal random matrix theory we find that describes the dynamics of these simple operators. Uh, will sort of tell us what happens after scrambling. It'll be the right 
random matrix theory to tell you about the interior of the black hole. So let me give an outline of the rest of this talk. So we're going to start off with a little story about life in Krilov space. So I'm going to introduce you to the Lantroff algorithm, if it's not something you're familiar with, and Krilov subspaces, and how they relate to the theory of orthogonal polynomials. And I'll use this to give you sort of a phenomenology of Lantroff sequences to understand how physics is described in this language that I'm going to be using. And we'll talk about k-complexity itself. So I'm going to give a slightly sort of refined notion of k-complexity that's different than the notion of k-complexity that existed in the previous literature. And I'm going to use that to describe what are the universal regimes of complexity growth that correspond to the black hole exterior and the black hole interior. Next, I'll talk about how one can see these universal regimes in simple gravitational theories. So I'll show that these features I described of k-complexity are reproduced in JT gravity and large C 2D CFTs. And then the last thing is I'll connect sort of ideas I've talked about in the sort of last, in the first three sections uh, to a notion of sort of a complexity RG. So to understand how renormalizing in complexity space gives the emergence of some nice random matrix theory that encapsulates this universal physics. So that's the outline of the talk and, and then my sort of brief introduction. So let me pause here for a, a few minutes to see uh, if there's any questions about what I've said so far or where we're going. Okay, wonderful. I'll keep going, but do jump in anytime if you have questions. So let's talk about life in Krilov space. So the Lanschow algorithm is a method to find uh, what is sort of a useful basis for approximating the largest or most extreme eigenvalues of an operator. And the way one does this, well, let me start with a little bit of notation. So we can think about an operator A as some state, a state that lives in the, the GNS Hilbert space. So here is my operator A as a state in this Hilbert space. And I can define some uh, inner product on these states where I take the trace of rho to the one half A dagger, rho to the one half B, where rho is some density matrix. And everything I'm talking about today, more or less, that density matrix is just going to be the thermal density matrix at some temperature beta. On this GNS Hilbert space, the Louvillian, that is the commutator with the Hamiltonian, is a Hermitian operator. So the Louvillian acts on my state A to give me the state described by the operator of H, uh, comma A. And so if we start with some operator O, we can generate the Krilov basis of operators in this space by acting with the Louvillian and then just using the Gram-Schmidt procedure to orthogonalize. So I can start with the operator O, and then the next operator is the Louvillian acting on O, and then I can do it again, so like an L squared on O. But this time, it's actually not orthogonal to L acting on O, and so I have to subtract a piece out uh, in order to get a new uh, orthonormal state. So we're going to label all of these this orthonormal basis of the GNS Hilbert space by ON, or at least the sort of subspace that's spanned by acting many times with the Louvillian. Uh, and we're going to note that can be you know, always written as a polynomial acting on this base state. So remember that you know, the state ON was really just sort of L acting N times on O, and then we subtract a bunch of lower powers to make it orthogonal. So that's why it's just some uh, degree N polynomial acting on the original state I started with. These polynomials are defined by a recursion relation. So when L acts on Pn, that it acts on the nth state, it generates the nth plus one polynomial, or the, the next state in the chain. And then we also generate some piece that's of lower degree, that is the piece that's not orthogonal and we have to subtract away. Uh, the coefficient that sort of tells you about uh, the relative weighting of the uh, polynomial of degree n plus one and n minus one, these are the Lanchos coefficients, and together we call them the Lanchos sequence. Uh, as I said, these uh, states are a basis, and given that they're a basis, it means these polynomials are orthogonal, or rather, even here, here in them as orthonormal polynomials. So, in the continuum notation, it's sort of easiest to see. So, let's think about, say, some uh, measure and say frequency space here, so d mu. Uh, and then 
the statement that these states are orthonormal is just the statement then that the integral over omega of these polynomials is the delta function. This measure here uh, is something I'm going to call the operated wa operator weighted spectral measure. I give it that name because it depends on two things. It depends both on the underlying spectral density of my theory. Here's you know rho of omega, but also depends on the operator itself. You know, there's, a, there's sort of an operator wave function, a reweighting of the spectral density uh, given by that operator. Uh, sorry, just a oh. small question. Yep. Uh, what is n? Is it just a normalization of the measure? Oh, just a normalization of the measure, yeah. OK, thank you. So here, oh, sorry. Go ahead, go ahead. Oh, yeah, so yeah, it, I think I, here probably I'm just normalizing the measure to integrate to one. OK, thank you. So uh, like, for example, let's say, so the first, uh, the, the first such polynomial is supposedly del T of O, right? Yes. And the, so you're saying that, so I should, we should have the two point function of O and del T of O vanish. Is that what you want to be, for them to be orthonormal? Yes. So they, so yes, that's that true. Happen? Yeah, how does oh, here, yeah, so I should say here, here, this is true just because, um, that uh, yeah, I, I've made one simplification here I didn't tell you about where I assumed my operator O was Hermitian, and therefore all of the moments are even and the odd moments vanish. So if the odd moments don't vanish, there's another term here you have to worry about, and you have to modify this recursion relation slightly. I see, but yeah, so what you just described there was an odd moment of the. Uh, the real time, yeah, of the two-point function. Uh, okay, thank you. Great. So in the basis, in this orthonormal basis I've constructed, the Lavillian takes this form. It takes a tri-diagonal form where those Lancho sequence just fill up these two sort of next to diagonal rows. Just to follow up on what Nima was saying, if my operator wasn't Hermitian, there would be another row of non-zero coefficients down the middle here. These are usually denoted by like a n as opposed to Bn. So one thing just to note is that the spectrum of this uh, complete matrix L is fixed and independent of whatever seed operator I use to construct my basis of states. That's just because it's just the Lovellian and nothing I can do can, you know, it's, you know, just the Hamiltonian, nothing I can do can change the spectrum of the Hamiltonian. But the expression in terms of these Bi does depend on the operator O. So if I built a basis out of different operator, some different operator O prime, I would get different coefficients, a different Lancho sequence, so some B primes, it would still be tri-diagonal. They would just be different numbers. And the information that I wrote here is sort of encoded in three equivalent ways. So it's, you know, you could extract all of these coefficients just from the real-time two-point function. Now, equivalently, you could extract it from this uh, operator-weighted spectral measure that is just the Fourier transform of the real-time two-point function, which is sort of obvious that those two things contain the same information. Or one can just extract it from the, the, the Lancho sequence. So all of these three things are sort of equivalent data to each other. Uh, to go between these last two, to go between the spectral measure and the Lancho's coefficients, one way to do it is the moment method. Uh, the moment method says you just define a matrix built out of a matrix say Mij built out of the uh, or each sort of entry in that matrix is the i plus j moment of the two point function. And then one has that you can relate, say, products of the Lanchos coefficients to determinants of you know, sub-matrices of this moment matrix. Uh, and then one can use this correspondence, sort of algorithmically extract the coefficients from the set of all these determinants. Uh, I say this not because we're going to use the moment method in any detail, but just to really note the correspondence of, between larger Lanchos coefficients and larger moments of the two-point function. So in general, small Lanchos coefficients describe small moments and large Lanchos coefficients describe very large moments of the two-point function. So Sorry. now, oh, go ahead. Hey, Jamie, yeah, just, just uh, there were a lot of definitions. So just to uh, make sure I understand, so these B, these Lanchos coefficients were eigenvalues of this, after you diagonalize them, is that what they, they were or? Not eigenvalues, it, it gives a tri-diagonal form we see here for the Louvillian. Oh, I see. So the Lanchos coefficients really tell you about, you know, it depends how you want to think about them. One way to think about them is they describe 
Oh, I went back too far. My computer's just a little slow. They describe this recursion relation of how you get from uh, one state to the next state. So how you how you sort of jump up. Um, you can think about them also as like when you act, when you do a little bit of time evolution, they tell you sort of how much you, how quickly you're generating new orthogonal states. That is, how much does a little bit of time evolution generate a, a new state, and how much of it is sort of just the old states you were in before? So th this is sort of the same in that the kth derivative sort of depends on k minus one, k minus one, and k minus two derivatives, right? Yeah, well, it's telling you that when you say take another derivative how much is you, you have some new operator and what fraction of that operator is some new orthogonal state and which fraction of that operator is sort of something you were already had in your basis before so it's sort of telling you like the the rate at which you're generating new operators in your theory when yeah. you time evolve yeah yeah thank you so much thanks and that you i guess you can see is that you know when you act with the louvillian these sort of act like ladder operators right they take a state you know and position one and take it to position two. And so they sort of tell you the rate at which you're sort of ascending up this chain or as, you know, ascending in complexity, we'll want to say. Good. Okay. Of course, you know, I've, I've given you a lot of these definitions and so it's sort of a lot to maybe absorb. And so what I want to do now is just sort of relate the, the phenomenology of Lantra sequences to the phenomenology of, say, the spectral measure or the real time two point functions. So you can kind of build a mental picture of what this data in, in this sort of krill up space or these Lantra sequence actually mean. So to do this, although it's not important, I'm going to just sort of think about continual spe continuum spectral measures. So I'm not going to think about discrete uh, basis of frequencies, but that, that's not something that actually really matters when we're talking about sort of low moments or low n Lantros coefficients. So one thing you might want to know is how the Lantros coefficients grow. So to do that, what we can think, imagine is that, say over some large regime of frequencies or asymptotically that the spectral measure is decaying uh, exponentially with some power. So it decays like, you know, the exponential of minus omega to the power gamma. And then uh, to sort of, in, in the Lantros uh, language, what that means is that the Lantros coefficients are growing they grow like n to one over gamma. So let me give you some examples. Here are two different spectral measures. One is just e to the minus omega. The one goes like e to the minus omega squared. Here I can just plot for you the corresponding real time two point function of those spectral measures. And then I can plot for you their Lantros sequences. So we see that the e to the minus omega corresponds to this linear growth in the Lantros coefficients and this. Uh, minus um, e to the minus omega squared corresponds to uh, the square root growth. So, so sorry, in the real time picture, a gamma is what? Like what? So the um, free transfer of this guy. Yeah, this this story is telling you about how this is decaying. So in we you know it's e to the minus omega it decays like one over one plus t squared, and when it's uh, minus omega squared, it decays like e to the minus t squared. So it's telling you about how this uh, decays in time. Um, okay, all right, thanks. So you can ask about how the Lantros coefficients stop growing. So they could grow forever, but often they will stop. Uh, they stop when the uh, frequency domain of our measure is uh, compact and you know, when it's bounded. So if we assume that the frequencies are all contained in some interval where it's, you know, the absolute value of omega is less than some omega naught, then asymptotically, these Lantros coefficients will grow, uh, will become linear, and they'll linearize to say a mega naught over two. So just to show you, here's some bunch of spectral measures you could write. These are all compactly supported, say uh, in the minus a mega naught to a mega naught, and they just differ in, in the power, the sort of fall off at the edge. Uh, here I'll, I'll, pl I'll plot them just as if it was minus one to one. So I'll take a mega naught equals one. So here is the real time two point function. It doesn't really matter too much what this function is, just to show you what they look like. The important thing here is the Lantros coefficients. And so one sees uh, actually, in addition just to the fact here that they all plateau to this uh, omega naught over two at 0.5, you can actually even relate the behavior at the spectral edge to the rate at which they approach this. So we see that the behavior at the edge was this exponent beta and the coefficient of the sort of one over n squared approach to this plateau is just set by beta. 
You can also ask how do lattice coefficients respond to gaps in the spectrum, places sort of where you have some under density uh, in the spectral measure. And the gap leads to some uh, alternating behavior. So uh, here, I just plot some sort of uh, example here. So here I have, again, some compactly supported measure between minus here, minus 10 and 10, uh, again, with some fall-off beta at the edge, but I've given some gap in the middle set by some power alpha. So here is the corresponding uh, real-time two-point function. And here is the Lantros sequence. So what's nice is that one sees here is that the gap in the spectrum determines sort of an alternating behavior. So instead of approaching the plateau uh, monotonically, now I sort of hop up and down between above it and below it. And this alternating term, which decays like one over n here, uh, is set by this coefficient or this, sort of this exponent alpha. And you can put all of this together. So here is a you know, rather phenomenologically in interesting, I think, uh, spectral measure. So it has all these features we talked about. It has some gap in the spectrum set by alpha, some bounded edge with some coefficient beta, and then some decay uh, set by gamma. And here you can see uh, the corresponding real-time two-point functions. And again, I just want to sort of focus on the Lantros data. So again, we see this is sort of combined all these features. So the fact that I had this decay gives me this linear ascent. The fact that it's bounded means that it plateaus at some finite value. And the fact that when it goes up to the plateau and it sort of alternates back and forth is set by this gap that I put in the spectrum. Say some gap, say maybe you would think in, your, in, a, in a model that would arise because you had eigenvalue repulsion in a chaotic theory. So let's talk about uh, a little bit more about the sort of universal regimes, the universal features in this Lantros data. So there's two things uh, that I want to extract from the Lantros sequences for compact spectra. The first part, this place where uh, the Lantros uh, coefficients are increasing, I'm going to call the Lantros ascent. And this is the part of the Lantros sequence that's really telling me about uh, thermalization and scrambling. So it's you know the part that's dealing with the slope of my real-time two-point function, how my correlation function is decaying at early times. The next part is the plateau. And the plateau is really sort of about how I reach the edge of my spectral measure. And so it's about the sort of high frequency noise that sets in after I've uh, been decaying, and then tells me sort of about the ramp. So the alternating uh, coefficients that tell me about the uh, eigenvalue repulsion or the thing responsible for the ramp in the sort of average two point function. Uh, when dealing with a finite dimensional system, as opposed to these sort of continuous measures that I've been talking about, there's also a third interesting regime. And that's that after, say, times that are ordered the size of my system, uh, it actually doesn't sort of sit at this plateau forever. The Lantros coefficients actually decay all the way down to zero. This is what I'll call the Lantros descent. Uh, so it comes in at times that are order e to the s, that is ordered to the system size. And it really is a part of the sequence that reflects not the continuum measure, but the discreteness of the spectrum. This is not something I talk very much more about in my talk, but if you're curious, we say more things about it in our paper. I really only want to uh, mention it just to, to highlight one thing. So the Lantros ascent is the beginning of the Lantros sequence, a small n. So it's a thing that's sensitive to low order moments of my two point function. And so that's really only sensitive to the smooth features of this operator weighted spectral measure. So for example, if I had some, uh, theory where I had equally spaced eigenvalues, but the operator weighted some of them differently in this way. Or I had a different theory where the operator weighted all the eigenvalues the same, but some of them were more dense than others. So these are sort of both produce the same operator weighted spectral measure, and they produce the same Lantros ascent, that the, the early Lantros coefficients really are not uh, high enough moments to distinguish between these sort of very fine grained details of uh, the spectrum or of the operator weighted spectral measure. On the other hand, the, the Lantros data descent is really built out of a very, very large, the largest moments. And so it's actually very finely sensitive to the precise eigenvalues of the spectrum. You know, at, at the end, actually, the, the zeros of this orthogonal polynomial that will build up, you know, that I use to build up my Lantros sequence will sit sort of exactly on all of the zeros 
of my sort of on all the eigenvalues of my my uh, spectrum. So this is the part of the Lantos sequence that takes this sort of smooth continuous operated operator weighted spectral measure and differentiates between these sort of different microscopic realization that tells you if it has the shape because of the eigenvalue density or because of the operator weighting. So that's kind of my overview of the phenomenology of Lancho sequences and Lancho's data. And are there any questions about that before we go on? Okay, I will keep moving along. So let's now talk a little bit about uh, K-complexity. So now I'll define some refined notion of K-complexity and describe uh, sort of the universal regimes of that complexity evolution that correspond to the universal regimes of the Lancho state I just talked about. So we can expand a time evolved operator in this Krilov basis of states, or this Krilov basis of operators. So we just think about it as some wave function in this Hilbert space, in the GNS Hilbert space. And the time evolution of this wave function is determined by the Lancho coefficients. So sort of in exactly the same way that the Lantos coefficients tell you how acting with the uh, Louvillian takes you, say, to higher or lower order polynomials, uh, these Lantos coefficients also tell you about the time derivative of this wave function and tell you how much it's moving uh, to larger n along this chain or to smaller n, how it's sort of diffusing or evolving in time. So it tells you how this wave function evolves. Uh, we want to think of position on this chain as indicating the complexity of the operator. And so the, the sort of definition of Krilov or K complexity we'll give is just you use this wave function and you take the uh, expectation value of the uh, position on the chain. That is the expectation value of N. So here is some simple operator which has some very, uh, you know, it's very peaked at the beginning and so has some very small complexity. And as it evolves in time, this wave function will spread out and the expectation value of n will grow with time. So the question I want to ask is how does k complexity evolve in the different universal regimes we described? So let's think first about the Lanchos ascent. So if the coefficients, uh, the Lanchos coefficients are growing linearly with n, then one can show that it leads to a complexity that's growing exponentially with time. On the other hand, if the Lanchos coefficients are growing more slowly, say they grow to n to like n to some delta where delta is less than one, then we have polynomial growth of the Lanchos coefficients. So we see immediately that if we want to reproduce the exponential growth in uh, the volume of the maximum volume slice, then we really want to be in this first case. We want to have linearly growing Lanchos coefficients uh, early on. Uh, what's nice actually is that uh, this is actually interesting that this is actually an upper bound. So if you have a local operator and local Hamiltonian, it's been shown that the Lanchos coefficients uh, at most can grow linearly with n. And in fact, this linear growth is actually saturated in chaotic systems. So chaotic systems, you know, have uh, an operator weighted spectral measure that's has these exponential tails in frequency, and these sort of the sort of spreading of this operator wave function leads to this maximal growth, this maximal linear growth in complexity. But sorry, here when you say chaotic, you mean that uh, the second behavior requires like lots of charges and stuff? I mean, generic system ex is expected to show the first behavior. Yeah, so chaotic systems show the first behavior. Uh, the converse is not true that a necessarily a system that's not chaotic will have uh, the second behavior. So there are, there are known examples where systems that are not chaotic also have this linear growth in Lanchos coefficients. I, I basically meant that like uh, this, this notion of chaos that we were talking about is that if I take some sort of a, a theory this type of, that has a second type behavior and yeah. just modifies Hamilton by a teeny tiny term, I should immediately get the first one. Is that intuition correct? Yes, I think so. OK, thanks. Next in the Lanchos Plateau, 
So in the Lantos Plateau, we had coefficients that were constant. And one can show that constant coefficients lead to linear growth of K complexity. So then we can see that if we have this linearly growing uh, Lantos coefficients uh, transitioning to constant Lantos coefficients, we're going to reproduce exactly the type of behavior we wanted for the maximal volume. That is, we have exponential growth of complexity that transitions to linear growth of complexity. And so we can assign, we can then understand the, the sort of origin of these two behaviors uh, in our bulk gravitational theory coming from the Lantros ascent and the Lantros plateau. Uh, of course, one thing we should note is that the linear complexity growth was the result of having a bounded spectrum. But a bounded spectrum is not a good approximation to the systems we're interested in. So we're interested in gravitational systems that really have an unbounded spectrum. In this case, you know, we really expect in, in say some unbounded theory that if we go to large enough omega, that the, the, the measure should just be determined by the sort of uh, thermal density matrix. And so that it should always fall off like e to the minus beta omega. In this case, the Lantos coefficients actually asymptotic will grow linearly forever. So we're never going to have this uh, transition to the plateau regime where we see the sort of behavior characteristic of the black hole interior. So we say, you know, what, what have we done wrong here? Well, I think what we've done wrong is that in addition to the Louvillian, I could define some other operator in my GNS Hilbert space. Uh, instead of acting with the commutator of the Hamiltonian on the operator, I can act with the anti-commutator. Uh, this operator, this sort of mean energy operator, commutes with the Louvillian. And so this mean energy is con conserved. So the Louvillian, as it sort of spreads our operator out along this k-chain, is never mixing operators of different mean energy. It's really a, a conserved charge. So even in chaotic systems, the Louvillian does not mix these different sectors of the Hilbert space together. And so it's not very useful that to think about the, the spreading into these different mean energies as being some sort of chaotic spreading generated by time evolution. These are sort of different sectors that are evolving independently. And so the, the refinement we want to make is that we should evaluate the complexity one super selection sector at a time. That is, we should, we should evaluate it at fixed mean energy. But sorry, just one cool question. Yes. Yeah. This, uh, this new operator you defined, this is highly non-local, is that right? Yes. Uh, so it's not the standard sense of, you know, conserved charge. Well, it is a conserved charge, but it's just like highly non-local conserved charge. Like the same way that H squared is a conserved charge or any. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a conserved charge. It, yeah, it's not exactly like energy is a conserved charge. Yeah, okay, thanks. I mean, I think the, the reason we want to look at them one sector at a time is just that the, the, the very sort of rapidly growing complexity is just the fact that you're sort of tunneling in time out into the thermal tails at very high energies. But this is not sort of the, the relevant part of the complexity we're interested in. And it's not something that's sort of generated by this, the theory being chaotic. It's very universal. It happens in any uh, finite temperature quantum field theory, whether it's integrable or not. And it's not really the, the interesting part of this exponential growth, which is telling you the operator is spreading very quickly out into the Hilbert space in a way that is uh, chaotic. And so we want to try to uh, sort of narrow down and refine our notion so we're really sensitive to this sort of chaotic spreading as opposed to just thermal spreading. We're going to write our operators in terms now. Uh, Instead of sort of the, in terms of the mean energy and energy difference. So I'll just write my operator as an integral over mean energy. And then in each fixed mean energy sector as an integral over the frequency that is the difference between the energies of the bra and the ket. And so the immediate thing to notice is that if I'm at some fixed energy here, then this integral over frequency is bounded between minus 2e and, and 2e, just because my, you know, the energy has a lower bound. So if we do that, we're going to rewrite our inner product in terms of some fixed mean energy version. So I'll break the trace rho to the one half a and rho to the one half b in terms of some integral over fixed mean energy, and then with e to the minus beta e times the fixed mean energy inner product. Where in the fixed mean energy inner product, I just integrate over frequencies with energy fixed. So 
So in each of these fixed mean energy sectors, we'll define a Lantra sequence of the fixed mean energy Hilbert space and uh, evolve the operator in the Krilov basis and compute the complexity at fixed mean energy. So since each sector is bounded from minus 2e to 2e, we reach a plateau where the Lantra's coefficients all plateau at, uh, at value e. And then only at the end, we can take the thermal average of these complexities. So we'll define the thermal complexity as the integral, the, the thermally weighted, sorry, yeah, the, the, yeah, the thermal, thermally weighted integral of the uh, complexity at each mean energy. And it turns out, you know, this is not the same thing as, you know, these things don't commute. So the complexity computed in the whole Hilbert space is not the same as the thermal average of the complexity in it at each mean energy. So here's our, the summary of the section. Uh, we can describe this Lantros ascent. So we can, we can say we can describe the exponentially growing complexity transitioning to linearly growing complexity as the Lantros ascent transitioning to the Lantros plateau in some theory where it fixed uh, mean energy. Uh, and so this notion that we have now of the this sort of thermally weighted complexity seems to capture the bulk, uh, the bulk dynamics, the transition of the uh, volume from growing exponentially to growing linearly. Uh, and we understand these in terms of these, the Lantros ascent in the first part, that is the linearly growing Lantros coefficients that are sort of characteristic of some chaotic system. And then the Lantros plateau, which are really telling us about the edge of the spectrum or the edge of the, the dominant spectrum in our theory. So let me go see if we can now discover these things we've been talking about in uh, sort of actual theories of gravity. So let's show that these features are reproduced in JT gravity and large C CFTs. But first, any questions about what I just said? Um, yeah, I don't understand what I'm going to ask, but some, how is it related to the black hole microstates in some way? Do you, because you expect that there is some average over all black hole microstates, some thermal average, and you will have something like this in each microstate. I, I don't... Yeah, so we'll look at fixed mean energy by fixed mean energy. So we'll look at like a chunk. So we'll take like e to the s microstates at a time, you know, some narrow band, but there'll still be exponentially many microstates. And then we'll look at the, you know, the complexity as you evolve in each of those bands alone and then average them. Okay. And so the, the, the complexity then will really be the story of the complexity at the, at the saddle of the, the thermal average. Okay, okay. Thank you. So, good. Okay. So let's see if this behavior we just discussed sort of very broadly can be realized in gravity. And so to do that, we'll kind of go through a little recipe. We'll take our gravitational theory and compute the two-point function, the real-time two-point function at fixed mean energy. We'll extract the moments. And then we'll use the moment method to compute the Lanchos coefficients. And then having done that, we'll compute the complexity at fixed mean energy. And then at the end, compute the thermal complexity by averaging over these fixed mean energy complexities. So in JT gravity, one can compute the average thermal two-point function, and it takes this general form. Uh, so just to note that the sort of things we need to compute this are both the spectrum of JT gravity and this operator wave function. So in JT gravity, we know what the spectrum is. Uh, here, we actually only need to know not the connected part, of the spectral density that describes, say, things like eigenvalue repulsion, but just the uh, product piece that is sort of the spectral density of the theory itself, um, because we're really only interested at sort of large, largest frequencies. We also have the operator wave function in these theories. This looks like a rather complicated expression, but the only thing that's sort of important for us and that will really matter is that uh, if you look at frequencies that are very large compared to uh, the inverse temperature, but very small compared to this, the, the edge of our spectrum, then one finds this, uh, this exponential e to the minus beta omega fall off. So it has exactly this type of behavior we're looking for uh, to generate a linear uh, ascent. 
So we can extract the moments by some saddle point approximation. And so there's two relevant regimes as we one might expect. So an N is sort of much larger than one, but small compared to the entropy. These moments are determined by this regime I just mentioned, that is they're determined by the exponential decay of the operator wave function. And when N is much larger than the entropy, the moments are determined by the behavior sort of at the edge of the spectrum, the edge of the spectral density. So there's two different saddles responsible for these two different regimes. And so we're in, we're in the first saddle determined by the exponential decay of the wave function. One finds as we expect that the Lantos coefficients grow linearly with N. And when we're in the second regime determined by the saddle that sees the edge of the spectrum, one finds that the Lantos coefficients uh, become constant and we see the emergence of the plateau. So one can find the complexity growth at fixed mean energy. And you find, as you might expect, that the complexity grows exponentially in time when you're in the first regime, and then grows linearly in time when you're in the second regime. And then as a last step, we can compute the thermal complexity by averaging over all these energies. And the formula is really just the same, except it replaces energy just with the uh, energy of the saddle. Of the saddle. So we, sorry, go ahead. Just a quick question. So how universal is this calculation? Uh, the details of the operator O supposedly went to that delta, that the formula that you flashed, and there was delta and gamma, right? What, what is gamma in that formula? Gamma, sorry. Um, um, you went back one more slide here. Yeah. These are yeah, gamma. Exactly. These are gamma functions. No, but there's this little gamma. What is that little gamma? So the yeah, 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 exactly. E to the power of s naught gamma. Yeah. So this is determining the spectral density in JT. This is not something you'd expect in any other theory. This is not a, a universal. Okay, so that, that's coming from the JT. But then the that's delta, JT. the capital delta. Capital. Delta. Uh, sorry, sorry. Uh, the, the, oh yeah, capital delta is just the dimension of this operator. Yeah. So that's that's. Yeah. You're saying that these results that you finally showed does not depend on delta, right? It doesn't depend on delta, no. So it's fully universal. Really what it depends on is that, yeah, th this, this is sort of very universal. It really depended on is that this particular operator wave function had some regime where it was decaying linearly. That was sort of the only thing that mattered. Yeah, so it, it's supposed to hold for any light uh, primary, any light operator. Yeah. I see. Thanks. So we can perform all the same calculations in a large C2D CFT, really just with some sort of nomenclature substitutions. So in a large C2D CFT, we also know the spectrum of the theory at large C. Uh, and we also know the operator wave function, thanks to a nice paper by Collier et al. And again, this wave function and have this nice property that there's this exponential decay with frequency. So we get the exact same behavior as we did in JT gravity for very much the same reasons, that it's really an analogous calculation. OK, so now that we've seen that we have these universal regimes of the Lancho sequence and that we can reproduce them in simple theories of gravity, we want to try to uh, connect them. Oh, if I may. Uh... The previous slide doesn't seem to depend on, uh, for instance, N free bosons or C free bosons uh, will display the same behavior. Uh, the only thing that matters is no. the center. No, yeah, I know. So, so here I'm assuming I'm in some, some large CCFD. I think here I've actually used, yeah. So what one should assume that this is sort of like a, an irrational large CCFT that has a good gravitational dual. So by good is, you mean by good you mean uh um what, what is good by good i mean so it, 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 we should assume we're in a, in a cft that has a gravitational description so I, I believe here we have used sort of typical sort of uh vacuum block dominance type uh yeah so we, Say need, again? we need a, we need a, a like a large gap oh so there is a large gap in operator dimensions yes yes exactly okay but, I'm just trying to you. trying to remember everything that went into the calculation that uh, they did. I okay. I, I should go back and check to give you a, a or 
yeah, one can go to the paper to see exactly all of the assumptions that went into this calculation. All right, thanks. But, but sorry, if you don't have a large gap at large enough energies, you still have a similar behavior, right? You have a Cardi behavior, right? I mean, the yeah, idea of large gap was that it would bring down that behavior to much lower energies, if I remember correctly. Okay, I am not recalling now off the top of my head exactly what I need to reproduce uh, this particular form of the wave function in their paper. So um, let's leave that for now and, and we can look into it later. Sure. Otherwise, I, I'm afraid I will say something that's not quite correct. So apologies that I, I can't give you as sharp an answer as I'd like to. Okay, so let's connect the sort of random matrix theory. Uh, let, let's connect the sort of these universal features of K complexity growth to uh, some complexity renormalization and random matrix theory description. So, uh, you know, th these are very universal properties of the Lancho sequence. So we might expect, you know, maybe we could see that sort of emergent universality under some sort of RG scheme. And the type of RG scheme I'm going to be interested in is integrating out the large complexity part of the spectrum uh, and to find some sort of effective low, some sort of low complexity Louvillian, which describes the sort of simple operators in the theory. And we'll treat the large complexities as sort of a random bath or some random environment that this uh, the sort of low, the low complexity part of the theory is coupled to. So in sort of the way we write down the Louvillian, here we'll think about the low complexity part as this part of this, the sort of this upper corner of my uh, Louvillian matrix. And it's the part that describes the continuous approximation to the operator weighted spectral measure. Well, the sort of environment part is going to be the thing that knows about the exact sort of spacing and separation of the microscopic eigenvalues. And they'll be coupled together by this sort of just this one little term off the diagonal that, that couples the dynamics of these two together. So let's consider the truncation of the Louvillian to some Krilov subspace, so spanned by the first n vectors in our Krilov space. So the effective spectral density uh, is just really the trace over the subspace. And if we try to do this, we can read off the effective spectral density that's used to compute averages. And it's given by this. It's given by the sum of the first n uh, polynomials, the first n of our orthogonal polynomial squared, uh, weighted by the spectral measure. So this density will depend on how large we take k as we take the system size, that is, say, scales like e to the n to infinity. So here are two different scalings we can do. We can do something first that I'll call the semi-classical limit. So just, just one yeah. question about conceptually what you're doing. So you're truncating the, in a sense, you're truncating the uh, series expansion for O of t at some order in uh, Fourier. In, in Taylor expansion, right? Yeah, to some approximation. Yeah, that's correct. And then in thinking about that coupled to the sort of high, high derivative part. Um, OK, yeah. OK, good, thanks. So if we take the sort of size of our subspace, we'll take our system size to infinity first, and then take the size of our subspace to infinity after, we never really see beyond this linear regime. And so we're gonna get a, a Lancho sequence that sort of stays linear forever and it's something I'll call the semi-classical limit. Or we can take uh, the size of our subspace and N to scale to infinity at the same time with some fixed ratio much greater than one. And then we can see sort of deeper into this plateau regime. And this is something I'll call the N scaling limit. Uh, what's nice is that, um, in this regime, we have this sort of universal end to our Lancho sequence, right? It's always sort of end somewhere in the plateau. And we, if we recall from the beginning, the end of our Lancho sequence is something that controls sort of the spectral density of the theory. So it's gonna be this sort of universal way that we've chopped off the theory here, that leads to some universal spectrum in, in how we approximate it. So first in the semi-classical limit, we take n to infinity first and then take k to infinity. Uh, 
Here, the level spacing really goes to zero, and we just obtain some continuous measure. Uh, and the spectral density becomes just what I'll call this semi-classical spectral density. Um, the scrambling time in our theory is order log n. And so you know, we, we expect if this has gone to, if we've taken sort of log n to infinity first, uh, then we're going to encode sort of an infinite linear growth of the Lanchos coefficients in our chaotic theory. We'll never see beyond that. In the n scaling limit, we take n to and k to infinity together at some fixed ratio. The expectable density now is sort of two pieces. It has this semi-classical piece I just mentioned, uh, which is sort of all of the contributions of the polynomials up to the k where the plateau starts. And it has some second piece uh, that describes the plateau. So here is how we'd write down the effective measure. Here's this first term from the up to the plateau and the second term from the plateau. So the semi-classical piece sort of describes uh, the ascent and all of the sort of smooth features of our operator operator weighted spectral measure. This second piece really only describes the plateau, and it has this universal form because of the universal form of the plateau. So this is what I just said. This controls the ascent. This controls the plateau. Uh, but what's interesting is that the the weighting of these two combinations. So as we increase r, we flow between this semi classical density and uh, this universal piece, which encodes the plateau. And so when R is very large, this first term becomes irrelevant. And the spectral density is entirely determined by the plateau. It's just saying sort of the plateau is very large compared to this little small ascent piece. So for large R, this density flows to the, what's this universal inverse semicircle. And this is precisely the, the spectral measure of a random matrix theory living in an infinite well potential. And so what this means is that when we chop off our Lavillian to deepen this plateau, what we're really doing is filling in our operated weighted spectral measure with the eigenvalue density of a random matrix theory that lives in an infinite well. Uh, we can form a related analysis for the remainder of the Lavillian, the sort of environment piece that we chopped off as we take uh, our cutoff much larger than the start of the plateau. That is really described this last half here. And what's interesting uh, about this picture here is so it was the, the plateau with some universal uh, end, some universal descent before, but now the plateau is in the beginning of this piece right here. And so instead of a universal descent, it's sort of a universal ascent for the environment. And what one finds is that this environment has a universal operator weighted spectral measure that's given instead of by the inverse semicircle, it's given by the semicircle. So this is the famous semicircle measure. And we can just, what it says is that to good approximation, we can replace the environment, just say, with the GUE. And so we get some nice picture where the sort of dynamics of our of our, the system of the low complexity part of our theory we're interested in is given by this random matrix theory that lives in an infinite well. And then it's coupled to some sort of noisy bath that's given by just the typical GUE. So let me summarize uh, as I'm a little bit over time. So thank you for being patient. Um, so we've expressed the dynamics of an operator in the Krilov space in terms of the Lancho sequence. And we've described the universal regimes of this Lancho sequence in terms of the Lancho's ascent, the Lancho's plateau, and the Lancho's descent. And we use these universal regimes to explain the universal evolution of our, some our refined k complexity that we define. So that is the thermal weighting of these fixed mean energy k complexities. And we matched it to the bulk evolution of the maximal volume outside and inside the black hole. So we matched the Lanchos ascent to the exponentially growing volume outside, and then the Lanchos plateau to the linearly growing volume inside. And then we explained sort of very, apologies, it's very sort of schematic given the time, but uh, explain how the, sort of the complexity RG picture in Kirillov space can relate these universal regimes to some emergence of a universal RMT description. So we related um, the, the universal characteristic of the plateau as some way to separate our theory into some random matrix theory and infinite well coupled to some GUE bath. So I will stop there and thank you for your attention and I'll take any questions. Thank you so much, Jamie.
Um, are there any questions? Yeah, I don't know, maybe I have a philosophical question. So the long okay. term, what do you see like a, what would be like a theory of quantum gravity, something that allows you to compute these eigenstates? So, I mean... Uh, well, yeah, one thing I'm interested in is understanding, say, how one might actually, well, to what extent one can sort of really more seriously perform this sort of our, this complexity RG. Say one can think about some gravitational theory as a way of, uh, coarse graining things that are very large complexity and giving you some effective description of this low dimensional subspace. Any other questions for Jamie? Uh, if I may, can make a comment. Uh, sure. Uh, well, <laughs> back in the day, uh, uh, Martin and I wrote a, a paper on application of uh, Krylov subspace uh, to similar questions, although we didn't look at complexity. I think it was before complexity, maybe even. Uh, but one aspect we did look at was relation to eigenstate thermalization hypothesis. Uh, and mm -hmm. specifically one place where that came in was this coefficients, uh, Lanzos coefficients that you call B that uh, there will be a uh, certain randomness in this coefficients which goes if i remember as one over root n where n is the total uh, dimension of the hilbert space that would be e to power s uh, in your um, in, in your notation uh, mm -hmm. i don't know if uh, have you and so this was very small but uh, as you know as you may remember the eth does kind of tries to look at quantities uh, of that type and they were essentially random quantities and that brought us into this sort of idea that you have a chain uh, built out of uh, uh, of essential answer sequence although in a little bit different way than what you presented but there will be a randomness really, and that would relate the problem to anderson localization or non-localization in, in the chain driven by the disorder of order one over uh, root n. Uh, do you have any comments uh, of, uh, in, in the context of your work? Uh, is eigenstate thermalization play any role here? Uh, because in your case, I didn't see any fluctuations in this uh, uh, Lanzas coefficients. And I wondered, OK, is it similar? Is it different? Or um, whether we yeah. did something else? Yeah, so at the level I've been discussing things, we were sort of assuming we could describe most things in terms of some smooth uh, spectral density or some smooth spectral measure. But indeed, you expect in some chaotic theory, something like ETH. And so you do expect these fluctuations. And, and exactly uh, as you said, um, whenever you have, you know, if in, in some sort of the, the relationship, I guess, of the sort of underlying discrete spectrum to the smooth one is that in, in some very sort of small narrow window, you have sort of e to the s states. And so you're sort of averaging over e to the s values. And so, or I guess, yeah, you know, you, 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 as exactly as you said, just by sort of the central limit type behavior, you expect fluctuations that are sort of the square root of that. Right. Um, so this is something we've been starting to think a little bit about and, and look at some more, but I don't have any concrete results, but I actually wasn't aware of your paper doing exactly this. I had kind of done a search and didn't find anything on ETH in the Lancho sequence. So I would actually be very interested to know the ref to get a reference for your paper so I can read about it. Well, Martin will confirm that the paper exists, right, Martin? Uh, yeah, but you know, we didn't look at the we did the Krilov subspace and the Lanchos, but we didn't study a lot of this behavior that you are saying about being linear or plateau or anything but we need oh, oh, the oh, oh, subspace and we effectively looked at the plateau region because uh the transition if i understand uh this uh, what i heard today was that uh, you transition uh, precisely at m from fr from growth to plateau in in Lancer's coefficient precisely at values of n which in our language would correspond to thermalization yes because these are, uh, uh, I think, uh, order s or order log n uh, values of, of the length in the Lancer sequence, which correspond to the, the more, the further you go into Lancer sequence, the longer times you probe. Uh, again, as per our 
you know, write up. Uh, so those are thermalization times. And we only looked, I think, at the regime, which in this language, which correspond to the plateau. And uh, in that regime, it, indeed, uh, the typical magnitude of the Lanza's coefficients, which uh, in the talk were called beta, was given by the bandwidth. And we looked at system with finite bandwidth only. That was a lattice system, which has both upper and lower cutoff and energy. So we didn't look at that transition from one regime to the other in terms of what happens in the chain. But in principle, this is precisely the thermalization problem, which I think is in parallel to what was described. Yeah, this is very interesting. Yeah, we, we're, we're very interested in this understanding sort of more about ETH and how it relates to things I've said. So I'm definitely very interested to read your paper. I'll, I'll send the reference if Martin doesn't mind. Uh, I put it in the chat, yeah. Oh, you already did, sorry. Great. Okay, I will read that with Thanks, read Martin. that with interest. And that will stop me from trying to reproduce things that you have done long ago. Thank uh, you for that. Any sure. other questions for Jamie? If not, let's thank Jamie again. Thank you. Wonderful talk. And thank you very much. Yeah, thanks so much. Um, yeah, thanks everyone for for the uh, for joining us. Have a great day. And say hi to Gordon if you see. I will.